I just welcome you also this morning, how good it is for us to be together and how good it is to worship. Because as we worship, you are actually posturing your heart and your mind before God. Did you know that? You're yielding to God. And in moments of worship, God can speak right into the intimacy of who you are and where you're at. When you come in that way just to say, God, I'm, oh, I don't even know if I can sing today because I'm depleted. But you still de- purpose by faith to say, God, but I want to hear from you. I want to meet with you. God doesn't need you to sing to connect with you. Did you know that? He doesn't need you to sing three songs and, okay, good, you did that, okay, next. No, no. He just wants your heart postured ready with him. And then he knows he can speak right in and say, I- I've got something for you. I want you to feel my love in my arms this morning. And he'll do the same as we get into his word, as we get into his truth, his teaching, uh, as we look at the example of Jesus. And, and because then God says, great, you're ready to listen, then I, I'm going to give you something more. Because I couldn't give you everything that I had in store for the world, but I will. When you're ready, I'll impart more to you and draw you closer. I'm going to take us back to Mark chapter 4, where we were last Sunday with Pastor Morrow. Pastor Morrow took us into Mark chapter 4, and if you heard that message, you remember it was titled, We Are Going to the Other Side, right? Did you enjoy that message last Sunday? That was good. If you didn't hear it yet, you can go online on YouTube, just type in Koine Acres Fellowship, and you can head to find that message. I I totally enjoyed it. I totally enjoyed Pastor Morrow, even when he kissed me on both cheeks and I I went red. (laughs) That was okay. I was experiencing the love of a brother. And I gave it back to him when we went out for lunch. So right in the restaurant, I just like, oh, yeah. But Pastor Morrow, as he shared out of this context of Mark chapter 4, of Jesus calls out in the storm, he brought some, he just landed some truths to us out of this text, right? Do you remember him saying this? The presence of a storm does not mean God is absent. You are not the only one going through your storm. Sometimes we feel like we are, <laughs> but there were many others you can see in this text that it, it's real. That there's others going through storms just, just like we do each day, each week. He also said, we talk ourselves out of believing that God cares because we think God's fallen asleep in the back of our boat. We talk ourselves into believing that must be true because where's God? He's not showing up right now. And then we blame God for the storm. God, you've done this to me. Why why are you doing this to me, God? Why don't you? And we put all kinds of blame and judgment on God. But what landed with me was when Pastor Mara followed that up and he said, God doesn't cast out what he created. So when we're blaming God for the storm, the storm, God didn't create the storm. The storm has come to take us out, right? To destroy our lives. And yet in the moment we could say, but God, you didn't create this. So where are you in the midst of this storm that we're walking out? I bring us back to this context this morning to ask you, each one of you, this question. Is how well do you know Jesus? How well do you know Jesus? Now I imagine immediately you're like, well, I know he's the son of God and he came to the earth. and he died. No, I'm not asking you what you know about Jesus. Then maybe some of your thoughts were, oh, yeah, yeah, he probably long hair and he had the robe. And, oh, yeah, I know what he looked. No, no, I'm not asking you to try to conjure up the physical. How well do you know Jesus, the Son of God, who said it's better for me to go away right now, leave the earth in his resurrected form, and have my Father's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come and be with you. How well do you know that Jesus? That's what I'm going to keep asking us this morning in the context of these chapters. And let me take us back to it because I'm going to set us into it. And then we're going to go to the other side. And we're going to get to the lake. Maybe last week you felt like, come on, what's on the other side of the lake? And Pastor Merle talked about the reward. Let's, let's go further and, and deeper into this. But context, let me remind you, or if you didn't hear this message, we read in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That day, this day that the events are recorded on, when evening came, Jesus said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side. What had happened earlier in the day? <laughs> what had happened throughout the day? Well, you can see in, in chapter, at the, earlier in chapter 4, you can see that Jesus was teaching the crowds of people. And he was teaching them about the sower and the seed. He was teaching about good soil and bad soil. He was talking about the word of God getting into our hearts. He was teaching about 
what the kingdom of God is like. And he talked about uh, the parable of the mustard seed and what our faith needed to be like. And then as he comes to the end of that section in verse 34, Jesus says, but when he was alone, he and his with his disciples, he explained everything to them. So picture that. At the end of all this teaching with the crowd, he says, all right, guys, now, come on, I, I want to, let's sit down. Like, you know, get, get a rock, get a stump, whatever. Let's, I want to explain this to you. And I can only imagine what that conversation and dialogue was like. As they, yeah, Jesus, tell me about, like, a mustard seed in the kingdom of heaven? Like, my mind's not getting it. You know, the, the conversations the disciples would have with him. And he unpacked, I, I imagine it would be a very personal conversation. A time where you go, ah, now I get him. I understand him better. I know what he's getting at and, and where he's taking us. And as, as the, they had this conversation, then at the end of that day, they headed out in the boats on the lake. And we know Pastor Morrow unpacked this passage for us saying that a, a storm came up, a furious squall came up. And the lakes that they're talking about here, you could, you could see the other side, right? It's not like crossing our oceans or even our Great Lakes, but you could see the other side. But the squall comes up, this wind starts coming. And we read that the, the waves are coming over the bow, and so much so that the boats are almost swamped. And in this moment, what stood out to me again is the disciples' response. I would ponder the question, how well did the disciples know Jesus? Because in this moment, they were filled with panic and fear, right? They're like, I, I think we're, the boat's going down. Somebody better wake Jesus up who's asleep in the back. You know, better, like, does he not care about us? We see some panic starting to set in. We also know that Jesus awoke, that he rebuked the storm, calmed the waves, and then he talked to the disciples very clearly about their faith and What's going on, guys? It's almost like I see in that question, do you not know me yet? <laughs> do you not catch on to what I've been teaching you? Are you not aware of where we're going together? He didn't ponder those things out. But what does this moment tell us when the disciples are freaking out and Jesus is sleeping? What does that tell us about Jesus? I would say that his heart and his mind is filled with peace. He knows, regardless of whatever's going to happen in the next few minutes, the next hour, that my father's in control. My father's got this. And so in this moment, when Jesus is restful and peaceful, it wasn't because he's ignorant, oblivious, or he didn't care about them. He knows whatever's going to happen, I know my father's going to walk us through this. The disciples didn't quite get that yet. And I think that's what caused them to rise up with some panic. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing the disciples. I'm not saying, what's wrong with these guys? Like, come on, if I were there, you know, hey, I, no, no. Because in my memory, I can go back to when I was 16 years old. I was in a canoe trip, in a canoe, on Lake Opiango in Algonquin Park. The biggest lake in Algonquin Park. And it's known for the winds and squalls that come up. It gets some good-sized waves. And on that day, there was 14 of us teenagers, three leaders, that were heading back to uh, the, the parking lot after our trip and the winds were coming and we were going into the wind and I remember how big the waves were because uh, my canoeing partner who's in the front of my canoe she would go up on the wave and then I'd see her like air no water under the front and then we'd come down and I was like these are some serious waves and I grew up on a lake but we were a number of canoes there were seven in total and three of us just kept pounding our way through it and just kept paddling and paddling and we watched four others start to drift back, and then we could just kind of see them. But, and I could see shores on both sides, but we knew that some canoes were swamping behind us. It was mid to later June, so the water was cold. The ice had only been out a month or a month and a half. And we're like, oh, what, we don't know what's going on. But the three canoes converged on the, the, the other side. I was just a little island. And when we did, we said, does anybody know? Nobody knew. And so at that moment, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking, what kind of hero can I be? <laughs> Our leader says, let's just stop and let's pray. We don't know what's going on back there, but let's pray and ask God for wisdom. So we did, and then we decided that three of us would hop in a canoe with no gear, and we'd paddle as fast as we could to the portage door to get a motorboat to send to our friends. Thankfully, everything turned out decently okay, but one was already experiencing mild hypothermia. The other was uh, already severe hypothermia. They had clothes off and campfire built, and they did the protocol. It was actually two of our leaders were lifeguards, so that was a bonus. And they were warming them up inside the sleeping bag. And, but yet, I could very arrogantly respond and say, Jesus, where were you? 
God, how could you allow this in this moment? In my adolescent level of faith. Where are you at in your relationship with Jesus? What level of faith are you at? Are you at an elementary level where it's easy to throw stones at God because he didn't care for you? Are you at an adolescent level of faith where you're just like, oh God, you know, I don't want you to correct my style, but if you can, you know, do this for me, that'd be good. <laughs> are you at an adult level of faith where, Jesus, I got the storm. You sit this one, out, I'll take care of it, you know. We get arrogant, don't we? Where's your faith at in its maturing with God and its humility with God? How well do you know Jesus as you walk day in and day out with him? I am pushing the envelope this morning with us because I believe that God is serious about his relationship with us. He's not casual in his commitment. He's not like, hey, do you want to go out with me? <laughs> do you want to hang out? No, no. He's not playing games with us. He says, no, I, I want to call you my child. I want you to call me father. I want to do life with you, not for 60, 70, or 80 years. I want to do life with you for eternity. And so I'm pressing into this this morning with us because I want us to experience the fullness and the joy and the excitement of the love that God has for us. I liked how Pastor Morrow last week said, what would the outcome have looked like if the disciples had paused for a moment in their panic and said, well, What's Jesus doing? <laughs> He's sleeping. Maybe let's just lay down and join him and see if that's the right thing to do. And, and I pictured, what would that be like if the guys just all started to, you know, lay down beside Jesus and they're kind of looking up and watching the water still sloshing in and, you know, thinking, how long is this going to be? And, hey, Peter, check your Fitbit. How's your heart rate right now, you know? Like, what, what would have been going on in their mind? Or would they have just laid down because the father said, just do what my son's doing? And what we read in Scripture, the Amplified Version, says that when Jesus rebuked the waves, the waves just gave up. It was like they were tired. <laughs> and when Jesus rebuked them, it's kind of like, waves, give up. Wind, come on, come on. And they just gave up. If those disciples had been laying there looking, filled with faith, would the waves have given up? Saying, oh, they've joined the other side. <laughs> they know their creator of the wind. Okay, there's no sense bashing this boat any longer. With the storm of just giving up, tormenting them because they knew that their faith was focused on the Creator. What concerns me in this passage is the very last verse, verse 41. The disciples were terrified and asked each other, Who is this Jesus? That even the wind and the waves listen to him. In that moment, I see the disciples questioning, We don't really know this Jesus. What is he all about? I often thought the verse was, they were mesmerized. They were like, wow. But as I looked at each different translation, the word terrified or very, very afraid was still there. They had some fear, and I believe because they didn't totally know Jesus, what he was about, what he was capable of. So let's move into Mark chapter 5. This is about the transformation of a man. We're introduced to a man who was filled with many evil spirits. He was oppressed, possessed, controlled by. He was a man that you're about to see was fully transformed, fully transformed when he got to know Jesus. We hear the, read the description of this man that he lived within the tombs. You know what that means, right? The cemeteries. He lived there because nobody wanted to deal with him, and I believe he was running away from the light and sheltering himself in the darkness. And as he lived there, it says, Mark tells us in his report that no chains could bind this man. He would break free constantly. No iron shackles could hold his feet. He would constantly break those. Nobody could subdue this man uh, or the evil that was coming out of this man and manifesting itself. He was constantly, night and day, he would cry out. Not, not just, you know, 10 minutes. Night and day, Mark says, he would cry out. He was tormented. He was tormented the part where, I can't take this pain. Maybe if I cut myself with sharp stones, it will just relieve some of the pain that, is, that I'm feeling and experiencing. That was the torment that this man was experiencing in these moments. I don't know if you identify with that, but this was an emotional, spiritual, mental storm that this man was walking through. 
Many of us face storms every day. Maybe some to these degrees, feeling the torment, the pain, the how do I deal with this, wanting to run away from it. Well, let's see what happens here when Jesus shows up. Chapter 5, verse 6. When he saw, when the man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. The man saw Jesus from a distance and he recognized him, or the evil spirits did, and he ran to Jesus and fell immediately. Submission. Immediate submission. What I see in some of this is in the spiritual realm, there's some real clashing going on here. And the evil spirits knew who they were dealing with. And there's like, there's no point. Let's just cower at the feet of the Son of God and hope that he doesn't annihilate us. Like there was some recognition that was happening here in the spiritual realm because they knew who Jesus was. That's why I'm asking you, how well do you know Jesus today? As we see what unfolded here, I'm going to take us right to verse 8. For Jesus said to the man, come out of him, you evil spirit. And you can imagine what kind of authority, because Jesus also knew what he was dealing with. What kind of uh, uh, statement he used as he said that. And I back us up, because as Jesus said that, come out of him, you evil spirits. Look at verse 7. The man shouted at the top of his lungs, and I'm not going to shout that loud, but he said... What do you want with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. The evil spirits got the reality of the situation. They knew who Jesus was. What business do you have with us, Jesus, the Son of God? What are you going to do? And they called out. They identified who he was. Don't torture us. We swear to God that you will not torture us. Like they knew what Jesus was capable of. Do we know what Jesus is capable of? Look at verse 9. Then Jesus asked them, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of this area. My goodness, eh? Like when Jesus confronts the evil spirits, evil spirits submitted immediately acknowledging and begging and pleading that Jesus would not annihilate them. It's so interesting when the presence of evil cowers at the presence of God. Do you know Jesus? <laughs> Verse 11, we start to see, Mark tells us the events of what happened next. The man said, well, there's a herd of pigs. Just cast us into that herd, but please don't annihilate us. And so Jesus did. He cast the demons out of the man, sent them into what Mark says were about 2,000 pigs. And then we read the pigs ran toward the edge of the cliff and ran down and were drowned in the water that was there. Now, as you listen to that, sometimes we get sidetracked right away. And we think, ah, oh, what a waste of pork. Like, that, that could have been so good. What a barbecue. 2,000. Or we might get distracted by something else and just say, but why would Jesus do this? Like, that seems kind of weird. It doesn't even seem practical or reasonable. <laughs> See how your mind gets in the way? <laughs> Recognize that what evil was oppressing this man to torment himself and cry out day and night killed 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of evil, isn't it? I don't know. I haven't really done some scale weighing of evil, but my goodness what it translates into. And as this was unfolding, Jesus isn't concerned about the number of pigs. He's like, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Like, well, there's lots more pork that we can go for. He was concerned for the man and seeing him transform. He wanted the man to experience freedom and deliverance. And what we read next here, let's, let's go to verse 14. Those who've been tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what happened. I guess so, right? There wasn't a whole lot of entertainment then. Guys, 2,000 pigs. Like, do they float when they die? Like, do they sink right away? Like, what's going on? Who did this? Like, all kinds of questions, right? So the people all run out to see what happened. When they came to Jesus, verse 15, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid of what they were seeing. 
what I think is they couldn't rationalize what they were seeing. This doesn't make sense to us. Like, we were okay with the, the old crazy guy who lived in the cemetery, and yeah, he calls out yelling day and night. Just ignore him. Don't worry about him. Oh, he's, he started cutting himself? Ah, the poor guy, lost soul. You know, they were okay with life going on as normal when the evil is over here. But when the evil is taken care of and transformed out of the man, they're like, we don't have an understanding for this. Uh, their formulas didn't ma do the mathematical equation to figure it out. Like, this, this can't be God because we already said there's no God. So, so how has this happened? And they were afraid because they didn't want to think that through. How well do you know Jesus? When he does something powerful and transforming, does it cause you to respond with terror, with fear? How well do you know Jesus? My encouragement for us out of this message today is to take the time that God has given you in your life. Take the minutes, the hours, the months, take the moments and get to know Jesus so well. Because you are going through storms. There's other storms that are coming. But with Jesus, I'd rather be sleeping. With Jesus, I'd rather be sitting down dressed and in my right mind. With Jesus, there is hope. There is peace. Yesterday at the celebration of Paul Eckmeyer's life, we talked about, for, from 1 Peter chapter 1, there is an energetic, living hope that we can experience when Jesus is in our lives. Do you know that hope? Do you know that Jesus? Is he filling you every day as you walk in relationship with him? I'm aware that there is, the enemy tries to attack me. I'm aware of when the enemy is. I'm starting to get to know some of his schemes and his tactics. We are taught, we're taught, Jesus taught us that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy you. Be aware of the enemy's schemes. Paul says, stand on guard, stand strong in the Lord's name and in his mighty power. Put on the armor of God. I'm starting to see the enemy's tactics with me. I'm, I'm sure I'm not aware of all of them. But again, this morning I woke up and he was already trying to intimidate me. First thought of my mind was an intimidating thought. I'm like, where does that go? Wait a second here. I had intimidating thoughts yesterday morning. What's going on? Oh, this is a storm. <laughs> here we go. Okay, Jesus, what are you going to do? How are you going to throw? Do you want me to just lay down and go back to sleep? Oh, it's Sunday morning. No, I, I need to be up. <laughs> and as I prayed, God took me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Took me to Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God. And as I prayed through those truths, I'm like, the intimidating thoughts just kind of fell away. Like they just kind of gave up. And I was like, I almost laughed at it. I'm like, really? You're going to try that on me? <laughs> you know? But in the moment, the storm seems like it's taking us out. It's going to swamp our boat. Like life is going to be over. You know it because it comes at you to divide your marriage. You know it because it, it, the enemy attacks your identity. He says, you're not really a child of God. You, what you watch, what you talk, you're not really a child. The enemy comes at us with storms to attack. But what we read here is Jesus muzzled that storm. Do we know Jesus as the storm muzzler? <laughs> as one who will silence the enemy. Like that's who I want to be in a storm with. I'd rather be in the boat with Jesus than in the storm alone. But if I have to be in the storm, Jesus, I want to walk in the water with you. I want to experience what you have in store to bring me to victory. That's what Paul, Peter talked about in 1 Peter chapter 1 that I got to yesterday. Was you will experience the victory for your soul when you know Jesus. <laughs> And the living hope that he brings you. So let me bring us down to some application time this morning. As we look at this passage and how it flows out and what, what, ex, what this man experienced. Oh, actually, wait, just before we jump to application, you want to know what happened to the man, right? Okay, good, good. Okay, good. Good, you're still with me. Because we know where the disciples were at. They, had, they were terrified in the storm. We know that the crowds were afraid because they couldn't rationalize and figure this out. Who was left? It was the man. So let's look at verse 18. The man who was transformed. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. I guess so, right? Like, I don't want to be anywhere near where I used to live or any association. Jesus, let me come with you. Verse 19. Jesus did not let him, but said, 
Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Notice the difference here of what's happening. We've got the testimony of a completely transformed man who Jesus said, no, don't, don't come with me. Go tell your family what the Lord has done for you. When he showed up to his family, they might have been saying, he's like, hey, guys, I'm home. You know? They're like, wait a second. He's filled with so many evil spirits. He shouldn't be, you know, wait, but he looks different. <laughs> do we let him in? Mom, do we let him in? You know? And the man would have been so radiant, shining out the presence of God out of his life. How do I know this? Because it says he then went to the Decapolis, the ten cities around his area, and began to tell, this is what the Lord did for me. Wait, you? You're the guy who was filled with evil. Whoa, there must be a God, you know? And you could see the interactions that were happening there. How do we know that his life was transformed on the inside and the outside? Because it says the crowds were amazed at what they heard. They're amazed at the transformation that happened this one man alone. And by that point, probably the stories of the pig testimonies were catching up to them as well, saying, no, this is the real deal. This really, there's evidence of that the evil was cast out of him. So you could see some of what is unpacking here. This man got to know Jesus, <laughs> truly transformed him to now he's in his right mind. Spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. That's what he had been given. And so then he's sharing his story with others, and they're amazed. This is why I come to us as a church. Yes, 2,000 years after this, but we have the same Jesus. We have the same God. We go through storms, maybe not the physical ones, sometimes they're physical. But we go through lots of emotional, spiritual, family storms workplaces, identity stuff. I've already referred to it. You know your storms. How well do you know Jesus? This isn't a judgment call on you. This is an invitation to go deeper with him. This is an invitation to stay in the boat with him, to stay close to him. Let me give you some just obvious steps, but reminders for us. Getting to know Jesus, I encourage you, take time to observe Jesus. Just take time to observe and watch him. When you read the word and look at what Jesus does and how he responds, how he reacts, how he's proactive, the kind of times he spent with the Father, just observe Jesus in those moments. Put it into real-time situation. Like I look at this passage of the storm and I'm like, he was probably pretty tired after teaching all day and then doing private lessons with the disciples and you know, kind of weary and, you know, like, ah, oh, I just need some me time now. <laughs> no, maybe Jesus never said that. Let that sink in. <laughs> he always wanted time with the Father. So what did he do at the end of the day? But he took time with the disciples. He said, no, we're going we're to go together because there's, there's a man on the other side of the lake that the Father is taking us to, to deliver and transform him. Observe Jesus. See how he responded to people who ridiculed him, who accused him, who judged him, who spit in his face. Did Jesus, did Jesus go, like, oh, yeah, let me just call 10,000 angels and we'll give it to them really good, right? No. You saw him disarm that accuser. You saw him respond and look in the eyes of the person, and they were humbled by the moment because the eyes of heaven were looking at them. Observe Jesus, and you'll get to know him better. You'll get to know what, how he walked. John tells us, if you have faith in Jesus, then walk like Jesus walked. Trust in him. Look at the relationship of, between father and son. Number two, take time to listen to Jesus. If your quick response is, oh, Brian, I know, listening, I got it, I've done that before, okay, hurry up, move on, I don't have time to listen. Oh, wait, listen to Jesus, right? Listen, take time to listen. Listen to his answer to people who have the same question that you have. Listen for his response from the Father. His words are not to make you a morally good person. Jesus' response to you 
was to lead you to a completely transformed life by his spirit in you. We've talked here before about have conversation with God. It's also called prayer. But converse with God. But don't do all the talking. Do lots of the listening. Open your ears wide. Posture yourself so you can hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you, his child. Tell him, Jesus, I don't want to miss you when there's a crowd that responds or reacts. I want to see you in the crowd. Tell him that when, when he shows up, that you want your heart to, to start increasing its, its heart rate. <laughs> I, I want my heart to connect with yours, Lord. Remember the two who were on the road to Emmaus. And after Jesus revealed himself and then he was gone, they said, how did our hearts not burn inside of us? My prayer becomes, Lord Jesus, when you're here, let my heart burn. I want to know. I don't want to miss you for a moment. I want to experience that moment with you because you're, you've come intentionally to meet with me. When you're taking time to listen, what I do is say, Lord, because when I'm confronted with evil, <laughs> I want to know that you're here with me. I want to hear what you say to do. I don't want to try and be some kind of fleshly hero, macho Brian. And Yeah, I'll show everybody. I don't want to take them on. No, no, Jesus, you take them on. I'll, I'll back you up. <laughs> you know, I want you to be with me through that. Listen to Jesus to prepare you for your storms. Have you been transformed? By Jesus, by him, you inviting him to be your Lord and Savior, the Lord of your life. Transform, maybe you weren't filled with the legion of, of, of demons coming after you, but you know the enemy, if you don't give your life to God, the enemy is going to destroy you because you were created to live for eternity and the enemy wants to stop you here in the temporary. Have you been transformed, your heart, soul, and mind? And the last thing I'm going to highlight is take time for your faith to grow in Jesus. Your faith to grow in God. Take time for it to grow. How does faith grow? It's kind of like a muscle. Uh, the more you use it, <laughs> the more you work out with it, the more strength it's going to gain. In your walk by faith every day. That's why we're encouraged not to walk by sight. By sight, we could think we could figure it out. I know where my life's going. I've got these all mapped out for me. God calls us to walk by faith. As we do, our faith will grow. My faith becomes like, I remember saying, oh, I want to be like David. I want to be one who would see giants fall until I stood before my first giant. And then I was like, okay, did I really sign up for this? You know, God says, yeah, remember you prayed the prayer? You know? But when I walk with Jesus, the giants look a lot smaller. <laughs> because he says, no, no, this one's mine, Brian. You, you just walk with me. Take time to let your relationship grow daily. So be in conversation. Be in his word. That's living and active. This is where God records his love relationship with, with mankind throughout all history. This is where he recorded his walk with Jesus and Jesus' walk with the Father. We can learn so much and grow in our faith from reading and letting the Holy Spirit bring stuff alive to us right where we need it. Your faith will grow as your love grows, do you still have a love relationship with Jesus? <laughs> or has your love gotten a little stale and ah, and you just kind of left it on the shelf? One of my kids said they were talking with a coworker. And the coworker said, What religion are you anyway? <laughs> and she responded and started to talk about, well, it's not a religion. I actually call it a relationship that I have with God. Because I invited his son, Jesus Christ, to be my savior. And now it's a relationship that I get to walk out. And this person responds and says, well, I'm a Christian, but I've never really thought about it that way. That's why I come back and say, church, think about it. How well do you know Jesus? Are you in relationship with him or are you in religion with him? He wants to do life with you. He wants to call you up. We are all on a journey with God. We're all on a journey in life, and it can be with God or without God. It can be with God complacently, or it can be with God very intentionally. I'm asking you to pursue Jesus very intentionally so that you walk every day with him through storms, through sunny days, through challenges, through victories, that the presence of Christ will lead you. Has Jesus transformed you? We're going to sing a song. The worship team's going to lead us in a song. 
we're going to go back to the song, No Longer Slaves. I am a child of God. And as we go back there, because I want us to sing out what's true. And as we sing truth, to allow God to just press this message into your heart. You may be thinking, Brian, I hear you. I hear the message. I hear what you're saying. But I don't know if I can fit one more thing into my life. Like my schedule is pretty full and mapped out. Like right after service, we're going here. And then we've got this this afternoon, this tonight. And, and tomorrow is a whole lot busier than, than today is. And sometimes we convince ourselves that we don't have time for relationship. Isn't that odd? <laughs> when Jesus isn't even saying, hey, yeah, meet me at Starbucks. And we'll have, you know, give me, can you give me 15 minutes? For, no. He says, let's do life together. Yesterday we were talking and we had our devices out as a family and, and we kind of explored a, a little app or a little identifier that's called a screen time. For you Apple users, that's what it's called. For us Android users, it's called digital well-being. How much time have you spent on your device? And you can open it up and it'll actually tell you your apps of how much time did you spend today. It actually reveals how many times you picked your device up in an hour. <laughs> And so we were talking about this. Don't look at your phone right now, okay? Leave your phone down. We were talking about this as a family. And some of us discovered we had been on our phone for over two hours that day. Some said, ah, I'm closer to four hours. Some said, I'm seven plus hours. I'm not going to reveal what family member that was. But I remember speaking here. I was invited to speak here before I was on staff and on the team. And I was invited to speak at an effusion service to our youth and our young adults. And I was speaking about relationship and how God just wants relationship with us. And I was driving home for, uh, the day before and I just said, Lord, but how do I articulate this? What, what kind of illustration, what do you have for me to articulate to this group of students that, that you want relationship with them? And I won't forget what he said. He said, Brian, tell them that I want them to long after me like they long after their devices. Tell them that I want them to reach for me first in the morning like they want to reach and see who messaged me. What did I miss out on? And this was going back a few years. This was iPod days and MP3 player. But God already knew what attraction and attachments we were going to have to these. And I believe it's very similar that God says, oh yeah, there's time for me. You got time for all this. There's time for us just to do life together. So I come to ask you, how well do you know Jesus? Are you ready to take more time with him? Go deeper and farther, because he definitely wants to go deeper and farther with you. You, his sons, 